I'm at the George gravel pit where a thick calcrete sits atop old flood gravels. We know they're old because the age of the paleosol that sits on top of them, but also because they're deeply weathered clasts. These are, it's mostly basalt through here. Uh, the class are mostly basalt, but there are other uh, lithologies in here too. The traditional way to look at this deposit is that these gravels were deposited and then weathered over a long period of time. Certainly there are abundant weathered class here. They have that brown oxidized look. Um, a lot of class are broken or in or just ready to fall apart. Lots of cracked. See all these cracks. Everything's kind of flaking away. So all the signs of weathering. Yeah, so that's the typical look, right? This shows pretty good. Yeah, there you go. Broken half. Just by picking it up. Here again, large clasped. That telltale cracks and that exfoliation. So you're seeing all the same patterns pretty much in most all of the cobbles and the boulders. Let's go look up here. Yeah, so plenty of bird crap on that. Always nice. Always nice. Yeah, telltale cracks. This is definitely a weathered clasp. Some of these larger ones. Yeah, pretty, pretty consistent, pretty consistent. Classic weathered basalt, just, just almost wants to pull apart. Yeah, look at that. I mean, it doesn't take much to just break rock. In addition to the basalt, there are occasional quartzite clasts. In this, oh, there's a kind of whitish green, and then there's versions of basalt like this opal that's a part of a pillow pelagonite complex, so sort of a hydrothermal alteration, sort of lava moving into a wet area and then forming these variations on the basalt, these uh, sort of opal chunks. So the microcrystalline quartz, they're also pretty fractured up and they I don't think they would make very good uh, projectile points. But you do once in a while find um, places where they are pretty competent and, and uniform, you know, nice and homogenous. But most of the time they kind of have all these random fractures. And that's a product of weathering as, as well as just kind of the way they formed. But bright green in a sea of uh, black. Sometimes this is white or orange or yellow as well. And it looks kind of basaltic on the outside, but you crack it open and it's this glass. Yeah. Yeah, pretty cool. Beautiful stuff. So here's you know a chunk of basalt, weathered basalt, and then here's a granite. So rounded granite class from somewhere north of here. So there's some exotic material in this, which uh, helped um, Baker and I think Richmond before that, and some and some other folks, Neff, George Neff and Vic Baker, kind of put this site on the map back in the 70s. Let's look around a little more. It's cool how this uh, calcrete just consumes the sediment that it's overprinting. So that would be the cross section. And then looking down, you know, if you looked at this, there's not some big clast in the middle, right? Well, yes, there is. And little fractures are filled with calcium carbonate. This calcrete is a 
it's an interesting story in a lot of ways. Um, a soil story, a flood story, a groundwater story, and a paleotopography story, which goes hand in hand with with the tectonic uh, uplift history of the Saddle Mountains, Frenchman Hills, and other nearby ridges in the Acoma Fold Belt. See, these are chunks here of, uh, of that opal out of those pillow pelagonite complexes, and they're glued together thoroughly by this calcium carbonate. I like the term scaffolding, right? So the calcium carbonate is scaffolding on the sediment available to it here, gravelly. It could be loss, it could be sand, it could be a combination, it could be alluvial fan gravel. So the, the carbonate is just using the pore spaces, the interstices around the clasts to uh, to fill in and cement together and it does a really good job of that it's incredible so calcrete dry land processes dry land soil processes with some groundwater influence lowland setting seems to be the right call for where calcrete developed in this part of uh, south central washington cannonballs here. So certainly the vast majority of the clasts here are weathered, deeply weathered. I've been sitting here, you know, hundreds of thousands of years and show it. But do they all? Here's another piece of vesicular basalt and that stuff doesn't have any characteristics of a weathering rind or cracks or anything. So that's interesting. Vesicular. Just looks compact. Uh, nothing about that looks particularly weathered. There's that vesicular stuff that's just really well put together. Again, these vesicular pieces just don't show the same uh, degree of weathering. Here's another one. No flaking, no obvious cracks. You know, there's nothing that's loose. What I'm finding is everything that's fine-grained in a typical basalt seems to show pretty good weathering profiles. But this vesicular stuff that comes in pebbles to boulders, mixed in randomly everywhere, does not show that profile. And once in a while, you'll see other class that just don't really strike me as as weathered i mean this this shows no evidence now it's a small class and maybe all of its weathering rind has been knocked off and this is just the core stone left but this weathering as i've showed you goes all the way through either in cracks or in that onion skin look. That piece is unweathered. Now, why would that be? <laughs> why would that be? That. It's just 
It's on the way to becoming soil. It's two thirds of the way there. So why would that be? So are a hundred percent of the basalt clasts in this gravel outcrop deeply weathered? I'd agree that 90 plus percent are, but I'm not sure a hundred percent are. And if you have mixed in with weathered basalt, non-weathered or fresh basalt or competent material, that argues against this gravel weathering in place exclusively. It's remarkable. I mean, it's really remarkable. Every class I pull out just appears to have that rounded, smooth surface, like it was tumbled along, but doesn't have that concentric weathering or crack pattern like a lot of these, like a lot of these do, right? It did this flood, probably one, maybe two floods here, course across a stable, weathered bedrock surface and just rip up everything that they encountered. In that case, it would be pre-weathered, right? So if the floods are ice, ice age, they're younger than two million years old in this part of the world. The basalt is Miocene. It's been sitting around since whenever it was erupted and exposed. And in the George area, we're kind of on this flat plain into the Quincy Basin. We've got time in between the eruption and the floods for that bedrock surface to weather and to weather quite deeply. That weathering would take place uh, during the latest part of the Miocene and then during the Pliocene, certainly. Did the weathering occur in place or was the weathering prior to these clasts being liberated from their rocky footings and deposited here. Are these gravels weathered as a gravel body? Or is the gravel a collection of ripped up weathered material where the weathering took place during the Pliocene and not during the Pleistocene. Is it a different flow? Was this stuff liberated from a different flow? An unweathered flow? And everything else was coming from something that was sitting at the surface degrading? This is, a, this is a question a student could test, you know, by hammering on a thousand class or selecting all of the vesicular material you could just in a random transect, test a hundred class and then a random transect on a hundred non-vesicular class and see what you see what you find. But just this hasty vesicular competent. I mean, no question that stuff's put together. No evidence of a rind. You know, maybe a little geochemistry on that stuff to determine whether it's a 
it's a flow that can be identified. I don't know. Does vesicular basalt resist weathering? That sounds awfully close to a hypothesis. All right, well, that's the George Gravel Pit, one of the great Scabland sites. A cool place to see weathered flood gravels and a meter or more thick calcrete on top.